Aidan Cooney, thanks for joining me today. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you straight off the bat, um, you, you're probably uh, best known as the, as the founder and CEO of Opta. Um, you're currently, amongst other positions, the CEO, CEO and co-founder of, of, of Digital and Data Agency InCrowd. Uh, how did it all start for you? What, what, what's what's your, your story? How did you become a founder originally? I worked in the sort of early days of what is, uh, I suppose, could be described as the digital sports uh, marketplace. Um, I worked for a company called sports.com in the late 90s in the offices of IMG. And um, and that was a, a business part owned by IMG, part owned by Sportsline, which is a NASDAQ listed uh, sports, a digital sports business. and they raised some uh, some capital to to set up a European business um, with European sports. We were sort of going at that for two and a half years, um, and actually the, the sort of biggest issue for uh, the, the European business was that it didn't have data um, that that powered the propositions. American sports was fancy even then was was huge uh, huge business. Um, Sportsline had bought a company called Commissioner.com for over two billion dollars in the late 90s fundamentally fueled by the sort of change in uh, ncaa and nfl yeah that was powered by sort of detailed statistical data um live match centers were about detailed statistical whether it's bot scores or play by play um and there was no equivalent in in europe so i put a business case together internally at sports.com to to build a a play-by-play data performance data business um and at the time, it was rejected because uh, they were really, I mean, that European business was for them about capitalizing on betting uh, alongside fancy in the US market. And, and I think it was a, a sort of big picture view that betting complemented it, uh, although it was very nuanced and complicated. So I left to set up my own business. So it was really just a, a, a moment in time, an opportunity uh, to do so. And sports.com became my first customer or our first customer, I should say. So I left with the CTO of of um of sports.com uh, and we we set that business up together and that was in 2001 the year before the the 2002 world cup uh, which we launched for the 2002 world cup was that always in your mind to to, to go alone to to run your own business uh, or it was more opportunistic at, the, at that point in time certainly my father's view uh when i told him that that's what i wanted to do was that uh he was worried because he was an entrepreneur um, and he was worried that I was just doing it because he wanted to, he did it. Um, I never had any plans to to go down that line at all. I didn't really have any plans at full stop. So uh, I, I was sort of following my nose a little bit, I think. So yeah, there was no master plan. Um, it was just a sort of opportunity. What did you learn from that first experience? Because you, you were you were obviously uh, at Opta for for many many years, and yeah, I guess that was your sort of uh, real sort of. Um, coming out moment in the industry and I imagine you, you you took a lot from that experience into the projects that you've been involved in uh, which we'll come to in a minute uh, in more, more recent years. The sort of main thing I tried to uh, to change sort of next time around was that I, I had absolutely no market view um, at the time so so I, I, I knew that sports.com needed this product and that was literally my whole market plan. Um, and so I assumed that lots of other businesses in Europe would need it as well. Uh, but there was no sort of top down analysis of what the market was worth or, um, you know, and sort of any research based on whether that was a, a market problem that existed beyond sports.com. So we set the business up in end of 2001, uh, you know, right in time for the market collapse, uh, the, the, uh, the sort of first dot com bubble. So um, yeah, the proposition looked a lot windier. Um, and, you know, the reality is it did take time uh, to get going, you know, because looking back, it was all, you know, you think of it as explosive growth, but it, it actually took quite some time to get to get uh, to get going um, because we were way too early. I mean, you know, all the concepts we were coming up with. One of the things that we learned pretty quickly was that European audiences want something completely different to American audiences. American audiences are very comfortable with what I would call a bus timetable of statistics. You know, box score is effectively a load of numbers with abbreviations at the top of a column. That is not something that uh, cuts in the European market. So it was all about pretty pictures, you know, sort of sound bites, editorial sound bites, water cooler moments, as we used to call them. And uh, so the proposition was completely different. Um, and we knew none of that, obviously. So, um, so it took a long time to develop the proposition um, it was much more editorialized. Um, so, you know, people lifting 
um, the information out of the out of the data and sort of making that consumable. Um, you know, that was all things that we learned sort of through hard yards rather than you know really understanding the, the the sort of the product market fit. In my sort of ventures beyond Opta, um, you know, I've always tried to think about the market problem uh, on uh, you know and have much more um, research and testing on what the market problem is um, because. Uh, um, you don't try not to make the same mistake twice. I guess I can call it your current day job. I know you have you have many hats. So CEO and co-founder and Crowd, I'd love to know more about the the vision and what what motivated you to um, jump into the project. Uh, tell tell us more. Having sold Opta, we, we I basically had it uh, quite a lot of time um, to think about things. I sort of had a general view that uh, there was a big opportunity in sport. I sort of wasn't sure whether I wanted to stay in sport because there are lots of barriers to, to, to innovation and growth and development uh, in the market, which are always going to exist. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to take that into account when you're building your business plan. Um, but, but actually, the, the sort of the, the barriers mean that the opportunity is all, all the bigger in a, in a way. So, and, and the opportunity in sport is really fundamentally, you know, it's still, even today, um, predominantly a B2B TV audience proposition. So a sport enters into long-term contractual relationships with a broadcaster. Um, it has, uh, you know, in some cases, LOCs organizing events where it doesn't own the data um, or clubs where they own the data um, uh, at the local level um, of ticket buyers and hospitality buyers. You then have some ticketing agencies in the mix there as well. Uh, sponsorship are sold really, you know, certainly in Europe, predominantly in the back of television audiences. Um, so it, they are B2B businesses and uh, the evolution to, to B2C businesses is a, is a big opportunity. And I guess that's uh, the same view held by a, a lot of private money that's currently coming into, into sport, that that opportunity is significant. And the opportunity is not just about growing digital audiences, which is obviously where consumption uh, is currently going. It's about making existing uh, propositions more efficient as well. So, um, you know, it is inefficient to sell a long-term sponsorship in a fixed category um, with uh, lots of different uh, silos being packaged into one and tracked as one. The efficiency of that could be greatly increased using digital technology, whether it's television audiences or digital audiences. So um, that was the sort of fundamental idea. If you break that down, what is that? It's about making sure that you can uh, deploy content and messaging to multiple different channels uh, and be able to track that all back to a single place. It is about really fan engagement, and that means helping sport deploy their unique levers, uh, of which there are plenty, um, to, to win the battle for audience attention in an increasingly fragmented media landscape. Um, so that's complicated, particularly if you don't have the DNA of being a media business in the first place. I mean, if you speak to sports broadcasters, you know, they're that they are always thinking about how they win the battle for attention and and you know the levers that sports have um range from obviously access to talent players access to stadia the opportunity to create money can't buy uh, uh experiences um access to high resolution player and ball tracking data uh, obviously going back to my uh, sort of previous world um and how they deploy that um you know is is fundamental so that's the second and a lot of my investment strategy has been about i suppose adding to that area in particular, because I, I think that opportunity is huge. Uh, and then finally, how do you make money out of all this? You know, what, so it's all well and good talking about um, making things more efficient, but ultimately you need to optimize the way that you sell. And that is whether it, you're driving campaigns internally for tickets and hospitality or uh, externally for brands, um, you know, how you deploy um, those campaigns and track the performance of them. You know, that's a, a big area for us as well. So. Those are the sort of three different buckets. And, you know, my InCrowd is about solving those problems, but actually a lot of the investments I've made in other sports technology propositions are about uh, supplementing or complementing um, one of those three buckets as well. Uh, you mentioned um, barriers to innovation in, in the sports industry. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on that, what, what, where you see the challenges for companies, particularly digital and data or technology driven companies trying to introduce new ways of driving engagement and revenues for, for, for sports entities. Where, where are the 
where are the barriers? Where are the challenges that you've maybe come up against um, in the in the past? I mean, the barriers are sort of manifold, really. Um, I mean, sort of bucket one would be how sport is organised, um, you know, governance, uh, the way that um, the, you know, and you've compared that with American sport or Australian sport. You know, there's a lot of fundamental challenges to long-term thinking by the way that sport is, you know, promotion, relegation, um, governance structures, having sort of uh, non-independent board structures, which is obviously something that that uh, that sports are looking to resolve, uh, you know, and, and uh, that's big, a big theme in the last few years. So the difficulty, therefore, in implementing long-term thinking is, is, uh, is structural. Second is, uh, you know, DNA. I mean, the... I talked about the fact that sports historically have been B2B businesses, you know, moving to a sort of B2C mentality is a, you know, a pretty significant shift. Um, and that requires business change top to bottom uh, in order to, to be successful. Um, so, you know, these are things that don't happen overnight. Um, and I, I think um, uh, those are the sort of historically the things that have created those barriers um, also, the sort of the ecosystem, the relationships between the different partners, um, uh, you know, moving from uh, uh, moving to more partnership models, both in terms of, of how brands invest in sport, but also how sports work with the broadcasters. Um, I mean, the, the, the hundred last year, um, the, the way that from the beginning, the hundred was set up. Um, with a clear marketing proposition that the broadcasters, you know, but competitive broadcasters that day to day compete with each other, bought into the vision and they all work collaboratively and they hold had specific roles in that ecosystem. That was amazing. Um, and, you know, that was something that was genuinely groundbreaking, I think. So, um, you know, the, the, the nature of the relationship with the partners, um, change of the DNA and governance, those are the sort of three areas, I think, that that have been historically significant barriers.